Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Kalashevsky, Forensic Psychologist. Welcome to my YouTube channel. About three or four years ago, I put a video on here where I discussed and described different types of sex offenders. Uh, in that video, I talked about direct offenders, which were people who had physical contact with adults or children in their sex offending. And then I talked about offenders who tend to offend from a distance. These may be people who expose themselves to others, people who hide cameras in bathrooms or locker rooms, and also child porn offenders. Now that uh, video is quite popular. I think it's up to about 70,000 views now. Today I want to kind of do a part two, and I want to focus more and talk about the research and my professional experience in evaluating child porn offenders. Now a warning. Today I might talk about uh, some ideas or situations that may not be easy to hear about. And uh, frequently people have almost a visceral response to this type of topic. Now, uh, especially if you have your own trauma history, some of the things you might hear about uh, might not be easy to hear for you. All right, up until a few years ago, the research on child porn offenders and how the characteristics and the dynamics involved in this crime um, were not very well understood as compared to the other types of offenders that I talked about in the first video on types of sex offenders. And uh, the research on how aspects of this crime and um, aspects of the individuals involved and how these relate to forensic risk assessment was even less understood. So first, uh, let's define child pornography. Generally, we think of child pornography as photographs or videos, basically visual depictions of unclosed children. And we'll define children as uh, individuals who are under 18 years of old. Uh, laws specifically um, dealing with child pornography really didn't start appearing until the 1970s, believe it or not. Now many laws cite abusive, or uh, uh, cite something that's called child sexually abusive material. And this can, con can cover a variety of depictions of unclothed children or children engaged in sexual activity. As you can imagine, the delivery and availability of child pornography has changed significantly over the years. Uh, in the past, uh, people would typically purchase uh, child pornography through underground networks. Uh, most often this would be adult theaters or sex shops, and it was kind of like um, material that was kept under the counter. Then mail order child pornography became kind of the most um, popular delivery method. And I remember particularly earlier in my career, we would deal a lot with this, and there would be uh, like actual catalogs of different um, child pornography videos or, or um, photo books that um, the offender um, could order um, through sending a check-in. Now, uh, as you can imagine, with the birth and the growth of the internet, the amount of child pornography out in circulation has exploded. Now, as the delivery methods changed, the laws had to catch up. Uh, in the earlier days of these laws, the laws would um, often target just the distributor of this material. Then the laws moved on to um, targeting people who had physical possession of the material. And lastly, many of the laws now have upgraded to include viewing this material online as illegal. Now, some people who view child pornography argue that this is essentially a victimless crime. Uh, but there are plenty of experts who weigh in on this and argue that child pornography is not a victimless crime because the whole idea that there's a demand for this material leads to child victimization. People have to produce this material. Now, uh, the research on child porn offenders um, tends to break them down into two general groups. There's the online offenders, and these are offenders who are mostly involved in viewing, collecting, or trading these images. And the second group is what's called contact offenders. And contact offenders are individuals who um, either produce the child pornography themselves, they abuse children and record it, and either trade or distribute it somehow. Or the contact offenders are people who are involved in consuming child pornography as an avenue or a means um, towards 
being able to have access to a child or directly offend against a child. So these might be um, people who talk to a minor online and manipulate them into sending nude photos or videos. Um, these might be offenders who use child pornography as a way to sort of get online negotiations going so they can have access to a victim. Now, in the research, the relationship between a person who would be an online offender and a contact offender is really unclear. Do people just start out as online offenders and then they move into something more personal? Do most online offenders just stick to this type of offending? These are big questions that the research has not really uh, been able to uh, address or, or give us any type of scientific um, certainty. As you can imagine, uh, research with this population is hard to do um, and to try to assess whether or not there's a connection between online, online offenders, those who just view and consume child pornography, versus those who move into um, physical contact um, or um, online interaction um, to offend children is really uh, unclear and, in, and hasn't been established yet in the research. There's a lot of other research in the area. For example, some uh, research puts offenders into different groups like cyber sex only, no intent to meet child, schedulers, intent to meet child, traders of material. Um, some of the research tries to subgroup offenders in, uh, based on their motivations. Um, latent curiosity is a group in the research. Pedophiles, the type of engagement do they produce do they? So just trying to group offenders into groups based on their offending behavior for, the re for research purposes is very disparate. But how does the forensic psychologist examine all these factors to try to determine risk assessments of a child porn offender for sentencing or for treatment needs or for amenability? Now there are some frameworks that attempt to do this. One's called a motivation facilitation model and that has to um, do with looking at motivational factors. Is this person a pedophile or a hebophile? And how these characteristics can be uh, facilitated by either static or dynamic characteristics of the offender like antisocial personality disorder, mental illness, substance abuse. Uh, the bottom line is the forensic psychologist has to rely on risk factors um, already established in the research to know um, and to make um, some determination about how contact offenders or online offenders may pose as a risk. Now, if you want to know more about sex offender risk assessment, uh, there's videos on it uh, on my YouTube channel. And we, for the sake of our discussion today, we won't get into all those. Those are whole separate videos. I want to focus a little bit on online offenders and people who are primarily viewing child pornography. And I can tell you, in my experience, and you see some of this in the research, but in my experience, oftentimes what happens is the group that starts out by, starts out, or a person starts out by viewing child pornography, how does this happen? Well, they often find it through sexual oriented chat networks. So they may be on some of these chat groups um, that have sort of alternative, what you might call um, alternative sexual practices or interests or tastes. Uh, and then they'll get sent a link from someone. Um, what happens is a lot of times um, um, they might access this link, they might get interested, they might start having discussions with people that send them the link. Sometimes they're federal agents, by the way. And, and a lot of them say, well, I was just curious. Um, and I've met a lot of guys who said, I was just curious, and it turns out they have 8,000 images on their computer. So what typically happens is, is they start to engage with the child pornography. And the, these offenders begin to sort of progress in their offending. So oftentimes, they may start out by um, um, just viewing um, images of new children. And then this isn't stimulated enough. They become habituated. Uh, then they need to see children that are involved in sexual activity. And then pictures aren't enough, not stimulating enough. Then they need to see um, videos of children and sexual activity. And then the intensity of the acts in the video needs to increase. They move into more, uh, they start to, um, 
they need more stimulation. So some of these videos may have storylines, believe it or not. But also some of the actual acts in the video needs, need to become more intense. So for example, I've seen these people move into um, starting to consume and collect um, videos that have violence and domination themes. Uh, they need more intensity and, and what they'll end up doing is you'll find these offenders will have elaborate connect, uh, collections on their hard drives and they have them categorized. Um, I talked to a guy a couple of weeks ago that was chopping up videos and making sort of his greatest hits videos. Now, um, what, ha what we're talking about here is this use of child porn is becoming compulsive sexual behavior. Um, so it's compulsive sexual behavior that's used for masturbation and sexual satisfaction. It's not just a curiosity. Now, for some offenders, this somewhat passive consuming of child pornography ends up not being enough, and I've seen this many times. It's not stimulating enough anymore. Uh, for some, they need to move on to the real thing. They need the more intensity, and they move into contact offending, trying to access a child. Who moves on to contact offending from passive offending and who does not? That's a really interesting question I'd like to see the research examine. Now, a lot of times we catch people, they're arrested when they're still in that sort of you know, passive online collecting trading images. When it moves into soliciting a child uh, for sexual activity, that becomes a um, separate crime. But I can tell you from a risk um, perspective, you have compulsive sexual behavior, but then when it moves into a passive compulsion um, to an active um, wanting contact victimization, obviously that risks uh, that, that raises the risk level. All right, um, I could probably talk about this for three hours on here um, based on my experiences and what I know about the research. The bottom line is the research is still trying to catch up and for the forensic psychologist, um, you really need to look at a lot of the dynamics on, on what we already know about risk assessment, uh, but also um, some new dynamics that are occurring specifically in the child porn offender. All right, if you're interested in forensic psychology, please subscribe to the channel. If you know others who are interested in this type of thing, pass this along to others. I'm also on um, various outlets and social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Everything is under Dr. Jeff Kalshevsky, forensic psychologist. Thanks for tuning in.